DCIC, your export risk partner. ECIC, your export risk partner. Hello and welcome. By all accounts, Africa does not have the infrastructure it requires to boost intra-African trade, let alone trade with the rest of the world. Let me give you, say, a few examples. Debris congestion wars, ship bathing delays, and anchorages have all been well chronicled. Anyone who does trade in southern Africa knows the nightmare that is Bide Bridge. And, of course, uh, there's none in terms of uh, train services other than the limited cow trade. Think trade, think passengers, all inefficient. So the argument about financing infrastructure and or maintaining it is moot. So how do we do it? Do we have the money? What kind of money is required? And can we afford it? I'm Godfrey Mutizwa. My guests are Sapiti uh, Moremong, Chief Operating Officer, Africa 50. Bohani Tlungwane, uh, Managing Director, Trade and uh, working capital, APSA Bank. Mandy Sinkutu, Chief Operating Officer, the Export Credit Insurance Corporation of South Africa. And Rian Kutsia, Head Industry Planning and Projects at the Industrial Development Corporation. Thank you, uh, lady and uh, gentlemen, for your time. I think the issues are very well documented, they are very well understood, and the question really we want to address right at the outset is the issue of uh, the availability of uh, the money and the requirements uh, for that money. I want to start with you, Tsipidi, from an Africa 50 uh, perspective. Just lay the ground for us in terms of understanding what is required and hopefully the amounts as well, though a number of uh, figures have been bended around as I'm sure you are aware. Um, thank you for that, um, Godfrey. I think you started off really being quite stark and, for lack of a better word, sort of doomsday. Yes, there is a significant infrastructure gap. Um, there's significant gaps with, from a funding perspective. And the African Development Bank has made it quite clear that the deficit of the requirement is about 68 to $108 billion a year. So the question for many of us is how is it that we look to solve and meet this gap, right? I think as we're all aware, many of our African governments have huge financial constraints. Um, I think pre-COVID, the constraints were already there, but with COVID, these constraints are even more stark. So the question is, how is it that we collaborate across the various institutions, not just our governments, but our development finance institutions, um, commercial banks, as well as global investors and institutional investors? A very important um, statistic is that on the continent alone, we've got $2 trillion of institutional capital. Institutional capital that is still not being deployed into infrastructure. Many of our institutional investors, so pension funds and the like, are still not investing into this asset class. So how is it that as you know, project developers, institutions such as Africa 50, how is it that we make it investable for these pension funds? And just very quickly, I think, Godfrey, before I move on, is, you know, um, Africa 50 was actually set up by African governments. So the funding is 28 African government shareholders. We've got two cent African central banks, and we've got the African Development Bank as our anchor investor. So right there, an African institutions trying to meet an African infrastructure um, gap and deficit. So it's with these resources, and really our mandate is twofold. One, to make sure that we drive and create bankable infrastructure um, assets. One of the key issues on our continent is that the potential projects out there, 
by getting them bankable and ready for institutional investors as well as commercial banks has always been an issue. Secondly, is really seeing how we can mobilize capital. So once we've created these bankable assets, how is it that we're able to catalyze um, private sector capital, institutional capital? So I think those are really the, you know, the, the primary issues is how do we create bankable um, infrastructure assets and projects in our continent and really de-risking them for institutional investors to come through. And the final point is how do we look at our institutional investors' um, investment policies and mandates to make sure that they can enter and invest into infrastructure? I'll leave it at that. Thank you for those thoughts. I wonder, I've got a follow-up question for you. I attended, uh, I think it was uh, the annual meetings of the African Finance Corporation in Nigeria a few years ago, and the issue you raised around bankable projects was certainly one that was addressed and the work that's needed to move uh, on that front. But before we tackle it, uh, we've got a banker on the panel, so he should be thinking about the answer to that one. Um, before we go there, though, I wanted to tackle the issue of the political will for the financing of African infrastructure. You say Africa 50 has got two central banks. If uh, my uh, knowledge of Africa is correct, we should have north of uh, 54 or 55 if you play the politics around Western Sahara. And then you talk about the African governments that are members. If I again, if I am correct, we should be talking about 54, 55. Why is Africa not united as one voice in this instance and putting together the resources that we do know exist into this project? With anything, um, Godfrey, it takes time. I think the political will is there. It's just our ability to execute. And also, let's be very clear. I mean, Africa 50 is five years old. Um, but more importantly, it's really about us bringing along um, our various governments. The political will is there. It's just that with COVID, the past few years have really seen our governments looking to see how it is they one, drive employment, combat COVID, and look to see how they build back the economies. Yep. Mandisi, let me come to you. Your opening thoughts in respect to the issues that we have raised. So really overall, the will that's required for us to be able to provide the money that, is, that we need to build the infrastructure. And perhaps uh, you can raise also some of the impediments uh, to getting that money into the sector. Mandisi, can you hear me? Oh, thanks. Thanks, Godfrey. I think uh, you're right. I think now the challenges of infrastructure of the continent are well known. Mm. But I suppose at this, at this juncture, there are two key developments which could drive the impetus to address this uh, shortfall in infrastructure. I think the first one I would like to highlight is the recently concluded African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Um, it's important that as part of enabling more trade between the various regions of the continent and the various countries of the continent, we should then build infrastructure that links the various countries. That talks to border management infrastructure that facilitate more effective and efficient movements of goods and people. The other second imperative is um, the move towards um, clean energy as part of climate change considerations. I think uh, for Africa, there would be now available climate finance, which could be leveraged to fast track the development of renewable energy projects on the continent. Obviously, that will require collaboration between the players on the continent and from the developing countries. So there's put opportunities there for convergence and fast track, you know, this infrastructure development that we're talking about. I'll stop is, there. Yeah. Is the will there, in your view, though, when you look around uh, the work that you have been doing around the African continent, the customers that you have been able to follow into the African continent, in your view, and also from the evidence of your operations? I think there, there is will. For instance, you mentioned in your intro the Bay Bridge uh, 
water post as one of the thorny issues with the congestions that exist there. For instance, um, we've been able to be part of that project, pulling various players, South African commercial banks, um, Afrex Afric Bank, and ourselves with other shareholders, we're able to pull financing for the rehabilitation of that key border post. And it, what, what's going to happen there with new technology, it will fast track then the movements of good, the movement of goods and people. So you needed the support of the government of Zimbabwe and collaboration from all these different role players. So there is political will. Having said that, more recently, we've been seeing a lot of potential instability on various countries on the continent. Mm -hmm. So the political risk remains. So you do need um, political risk providers to insulate investors against the continuing political risks that we still observe on, in the various countries. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. So Tepiti said there was dark at the beginning, but uh, if you have spent time at Bybridge like I have and uh, seen the chaos that is there, I'm telling you, we would say we're pushing these political guys to move a little faster than they are doing because not only are they impeding trade, they're making it impossible uh, for integration to take place. Rian, let me come to you. Your opening thoughts as well, <clears throat> just in respect to uh, what we are seeing. Uh, from uh, efforts of the African government. Yes, they have set up the African continental free trade area, but uh, as uh, Atsapidi said at the beginning, these things take time. I want to know if you are encouraged. I also want to know if you are seeing the momentum and the will that's required for us really to begin to tackle the gaps that we know are there. No, thank you so much, Godfrey. I think. Um, there, there is always uh, uh, the, the will is there. I think that is the first point one need to state. However, the, the action happened almost in two directions. There are continental-wide initiatives that is being driven, but then there are also project-specific initiatives happening that give flares of hope. Um, um, you, you will see, for instance, that around projects, there are huge collaboration that you find between the different DFIs to try and find solutions, as well as commercial banks, in order to package risks and make it bankable. So I think um, uh, you'll, you'll find increased collaboration and will uh, from the different funders. I think also um, what you'll find and the need, I, I really agree with Cepidi, is to think that it, there's never enough projects to fund purely because they need to become bankable. So, so the attention need to be given not only on project finance as such, but also on the project development finance to make these projects bankable. And I see more and more project preparation facilities, et cetera, coming forward. Uh, another level that I can mention is that the continent is preparing. I know, for instance, in South Africa, in SADC's case, there is a whole gas master plan, natural gas master plan that is being developed in order to prepare inter um, uh, uh, country uh, 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 utilization and, and positive exploitation of those resources to the benefit of the continent. You find, for instance, that um, uh, master plans are developed, for, for instance, in the steel industry in South Africa to ensure that our export finance um, of these uh, uh, South African potential steel products will feed into those infrastructural investments to ensure that um, we uh, the infrastructural investment actually result in in localized supply of components. Um, um, you will see that, for instance, through our uh, the, the DTIC in South Africa is currently busy with the spatial or special economic zones, and there's specific focus on the two border. SEZs, the Nkumazi one, as well as the Makado Messina one, where we want to not only address the logistics around those border posts, but also to create logistics parks uh, adjacent to that to ensure the flow of goods and services, um, a fresh produce markets to ensure that, that local uh, suppliers of uh, smallholder farmers feed into those value chains. So the point I want to make, it is, it's, it's multidimensional, 
Um, it is there are things happening. We are preparing, but there's one thing that one need to measure uh, is the impact of COVID, which unfortunately caught us all um, by surprise, and we are adjusting to the new reality. And the whole. Um, progress in terms of vaccinations on the continent will be a huge uh, uh, a driver in order to fast track um, some of these developments. Thank you. 100%. Um, I wanted to follow up on uh, the bankable projects issue. Uh, Sapiti mentioned it, you have mentioned it. Um, I want to know what's being done on that front. As I said, I attended an Africa Finance Corporation annual general meeting a few years ago, and this was a, an issue that was discussed. And I think if I remember correctly, there was a suggestion that uh, the African Development Bank was among parties that was trying to ensure that this is available. Is this work that should be uh, funded out to the private sector because we know they are quicker and faster and more agile? Or do we wait for our continental institutions like the African Development Bank or perhaps the Africa Export-Import Bank I'm still with you, Rian. It needs to be, there's not one solution. It needs to be from all angles and it needs to be project specific. So it's very high risk activity, project preparation in a sense, because you, you might go into the project development and ultimately you, uh, you find that the project is not bankable. Um, so so it, it requires a huge risk appetite. Uh, for funders. So, so um, there need to be special arrangements uh, around that. And one cannot expect commercial funders as such to do that. So it need to be collaboration from bankers, but I think it also needs um, collaboration from experts in terms of assisting the technical assistance requirement to do so. And that is quite often need to be funded by grants. So, so um, I know, for instance, in the IDC case, um, in the past year, we have separated our project development activities from the rest of our funding because we just realized that it is so important and it need to have special emphasis. I also know that, that institutions such as Investment South Africa has put together teams from different DFIs in order to resolve um, those issues around specific projects uh, that is earmarked by, by Investment South Africa. So again, not one answer. It needs to be collaborative. And quite often, the solution needs to be uh, on a specific project basis. Because quite often, some project um, or, or support providers see the benefit of this specific project. It might be a digital economy one. Um, so, so one could potentially attract large uh, companies to assist. Uh, so, so there could be a role for, for private sector to play if there's an interest in that specific project. And, and of course, those private sector guys might not be keen to participate in a fund of funds or a big scheme, but might be interested in, in a specific project. Thanks. Well, let's, let's find out. Let's find out because our next question is going to, to be to uh, Bohani. Bohani, I want to know from your perspective is this is work that perhaps can be done uh, by the banks, but I also want your opening thoughts on uh, the conversation around uh, trying to ensure that we're able to finance this infrastructure that South Africa and the region requires. I just wish I could ask you if you were able to say one, two, three, in terms of the issues that should be addressed, this would be the way to approach it. I know I'm making it difficult for you, but you have a difficult job anyway. <laughs> Very good morning, uh, Godfrey, and to morning. my fellow panelists. I think there the are a number of uh, issues that have come up in this discussion, but maybe a good start for me uh, is to maybe let's address this question of our political will quickly to say that as we are today, uh, of the 54 countries that have signed up to the Continental Free Trade Agreement, 38 of those countries have already submitted articles of ratification and have also, in addition to that, agreed on a schedule of tariffs uh, for which zero tariffs will be applicable, schedule of goods for which uh, zero tariffs will be applicable. In addition to that, there has been an agreement on about 80% of the uh, goods uh, uh, lines in terms of where rules of origin should be applicable. Right. So, so as it is today, a number of the, those countries can actually enter into a prefer preferential uh, trade, uh, trade uh, relationship, right? So I think it's important to say that whilst we have certain challenges and nobody uh, should, should run away from those, we should also acknowledge the fact that uh, there has been a lot of progress since January 1. 
Ted. But I also do want to address um, the, this question of um, why is it um, financially viable increasingly for this infrastructure to be developed for investments to so start flowing into the various kinds of infrastructure. And by the way, I know we're talking about energy, ICT, transport, and so forth, which is quite critical yeah. for, the, for the successful implementation of the free trade agreement. I think the critical thing here, it's very important that contained, I think it's contained in the very nature of what the rules of origin mean. It's very important in that it means that uh, the rules of origin themselves define the types of goods and the value add that must happen, must occur in countries. And what does that mean? So it means instead of, um, uh, of us importing these goods from the rest of the world, we can add the value in the countries. And when we add the value in the countries, then we then qualify for the, for the zero tariffs. Now, this is very important for the, for the preferential trade relationships. This is very important. So the question, it's actually about the value, the cost of the value add versus the benefit that countries would start to, to actually um, experience as a result of um, uh, the preferential trade agreements. It's, it's an important point in that it talks not only to industrial productivity or industrial production, it talks to the very fact that the same infrastructure is what is required to facilitate the trade flow. So it, it, it enhances the very distribution channels we're looking for. So I think, you know, it's important that whilst we're all cognizant of the challenges and one, as I indicated, cannot run away from those, yeah. there are a number of positive developments that are making it increasingly attractive not only not only for 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 the for the traditional financial uh, suppliers in the in, in 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 africa but also for new entrants to come in yeah. i think uh, Tsepedi spoke about this the question is not the shortage of funds the question is yes. the shortage of bankable projects right and 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 in Bankable projects. Let me just finish here, Godfrey. It, so the, it's, it's the question of, of course, feasibility. It's the question of viability. It's the question of liquidity. It's the question of value generation. But also, it's the operating environment within which these projects actually occur. And that's the value of the free trade agreement, to make sure that there's a legal and a regulatory framework under which these projects are actually occurring. Um, there's clarity in terms of the political and economic environment as demanded uh, under the free trade agreement in terms of the operating environment. And lastly, of course, there is value in the, in the, in the particular sector that we're looking at. In, in other words, the sector has to be aligned with where the gap is, right? And we all know that it's in energy, it's in ICT, and it's in transport. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So I've got a double-barreled question for you, if you can answer uh, those two quickly. Number one. How busy are you on uh, projects connected to the intra-African trade? I'll, I'm asking you this question because since the beginning of the year, I have been looking for companies that have started under the AFCFTA. As you said, there are countries now that are ready to go and uh, drop the tariffs and trade under the conditions of the AFCFTA. But we continue to hear that it is not uh, happening yet. It's take, it takes a little more time. How busy are you, say, in respect to that work? Very busy. I think not just us. That's a nice as answer. Many, <laughs> as, uh, us as APSA, uh, as APSA group, and many other financial institutions. And, and maybe let's take a step back here. The question of intra-Africa trade, which I think we all know it's about 18% or so, give or take. Um, uh, as it is today, that very trade is being financed by a number of banks, including ours. Um, and increasingly, we are seeing not only the ask around, uh, you know, uh, facilitating these trade flows, but also the ask around investment. And this is why phase two of the free trade agreement is critical, because it talks to the protocol on competition, on investment, and on e-commerce, right? A particular of particular interest to me is on investment. So I think what is happening today, if you look at um, the various conversations we're having with financial institutions, with development financial institutions, and many other players in this space, we're seeing a lot more conversations around 
various ways that we need to think through in order to provide financing. We as a bank are seized with this question in multiple ways. And I think we all know this. For example, if I may give a practical example of the, of the trade financing gap of about $100 billion, give or yeah. take, that exists in, in the industry, to say that I think we need to take the conversation to the next step, which is what we're doing as well, is what are the most practical ways to start eating into that gap, right? Beyond the normal, standard, traditional financing issues that we know that require security, so forth, and all of that. And, and there is a lot of conversations that we're having around whether it is providing uh, bid bonds and guarantees linked to these kinds of projects that we're talking about, or providing financing in terms of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, purchase order financing and so forth, and all kinds of financing across the value chain that we, not just we as bank, in fact, there are multiple conversations and we as UPS have entered into multiple agreements with many DFIs, uh, some within the continent, some outside the continent, in order to try and solve this financing problem. Bohani, you and I, after this, need to sit down and talk, and I want to know what kind of projects you are working on. You don't need to give me the names of the companies that are doing it. I want to have an idea of uh, where they are coming from, the sectors they are in, uh, so we take this conversation forward. Sabide, I'm coming to you. Feel free, by the way, to contribute any thoughts you might have to add to the points that have been raised by the gentleman here. But I wanted to address the issue of uh, de-risking the projects. And I know this is a question for the ECIC as well. How do we do it? Uh, practically. We know this is an everyday issue that companies are grappling with. And we know, of course, that uh, most of the African countries uh, that uh, we call home are rated uh, grades that make the cost of capital uh, expensive. Please help me understand. From an uh, Africa 50 perspective, how do we go about doing this? Um, thanks for that, and I will actually address a few points from Bohani, but to address yes. your question on how does one look at de-risking, I think it first starts with the sponsors. Are you backing a credible sponsor with a track record who has done this before? That, to me, is a first step to de-risking any um, project. Somebody who's done it before, somebody who lives and breathes it on a daily basis. The second part is obviously going to be, I think Mandy C, you know, spoke about political risk insurance. The second part is going to be around currency, right? Our biggest issue, more often than not, these are long-term contracts, you know, power purchase agreements, uptake agreements that um, countries enter into, utilities enter into, and commercial banks enter into. Yeah. More often than not, dollar denominated versus the fact that we, you know, local currency um, revenues. So how is it that one, we deepen our capital markets? That's going to be critical, that we can't always depend on hard currency in order to fund and finance our projects. So how is it that we deepen our local capital markets? We look to use local currency in order to de-risk. That's going to be a critical factor. Absolutely. I think we've seen that our hedging markets are not deep enough in fact, to be able to, to, to cater for this. We've done it and we continue to use it. We use wraps such as ECIC. We use other, um, you know, partial guarantees, et cetera, to do this. This has been happening for many years and it will still continue. But I really think we need to expand sort of the tool set that we've been using to okay. date. Okay. You said you wanted to address our points uh, raised by Yusuf Bohani. Are you there? Are you there, Tepide? I'm hoping that you are not frozen. Oh, she's frozen. She's frozen. She wanted to raise, I think, uh, points raised uh, by uh, Bohani. But let's see if we can get her back and then I get her to contribute. I think I want everyone's thoughts around this de-risking issue. Uh, so I'll come to you, Mandisi. No, thanks, Godfrey. I think um, the polka risk issue is a real one on the, on the continent mm. that we cannot shy away from. We've seen more recently some of the governments being changed by military coups. And in some of the countries where we've seen emergence of insurgency activities and civil conflict, open civil conflict. So those things do impact business confidence um, 
and appetite of investors to, to invest, even for, for lenders as well. So an institution like ourselves, African Bank, African Development Bank, we play an important role in addressing some of these political risks. In our case, for instance, we would look at some of the elements of the political risks I've mentioned, war and civil disturbance, and we provide political risk insurance for that, for that sort of risk. That helps investors who want to make a long-term investment in some of these environments. So on the back of our cover, obviously within their own risk appetite as well, then they're able to make these long-term investments in infrastructure. So through this product, we're able to crowd in investment and long-term finance by various financial institutions into these types of projects. So the issue of political stability is one of the essential elements for the political environment and investment environment to thrive. And uh, obviously, alone will not be sufficient. I mentioned African Development Bank, African Bank, and many other private sector role players who are able to do that. But more recently, in our case, our mandate has been expanded to look at short-term trade coverage in, in positioning ECIC for the opportunities that will emerge from the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Yeah. And this way, what we're looking to do is to reinsure existing insurers, so to spread the risk, so that they can increase capacity available finance to various trading companies, then to take advantage of the trade opportunities. Yeah. So that is a, going to be a big element of the de-risking, because one way of de-risking is to share the risk on a broader pool. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think I'm very happy that you raised that issue because uh, we did see uh, with uh, the recent uh, riots here in South Africa, Sastria coming through and saying they were able to cover it. And then uh, I think uh, a few weeks after that, uh, we heard them saying, oh, no, they needed to go back uh, to the government uh, to see if uh, there was uh, more money that was required. So my question to you is, are you adequately capitalized to be able to handle the extra work that potentially could come with a, uh, a bigger growth, if you like, in uh, intra-African trade? Yeah, I think we've been in existence for about 20 years now. This is our 20th anniversary. I think in the past 10 years, we've grown our capital base. Fortunately, we are one of those state-owned companies in South Africa now, which we have a strong capital base, which you can leverage and then to drive this intra-Africa intra trade agenda that I've been talking about. So that's one of the reasons that the government and our Minister of Trade and Industry and Competition has been able to expand our mandate into the short-term trade space so that we can share risk with the existing role players. So we are fortunate in that sense that we do have the capital and we do have then the, the know-how to be able to enter that space and drive more activity between South Africa. Because well, South Africa is more concentrated in the SADAC region. Yes. And what we want to catapult is to catapult our companies to go to other regions of the continent. Yeah. Uh, Francophone countries, West Africa, East Africa. So I think that infrastructure leg, which we're talking about, is going to be key in connecting you know, countries on a cross-border basis. Yeah. And I think we're ready, we are well poised now to enter this new decade, which I can see that lies ahead. Yeah, quick question, quick question. I'm sure you heard my question to uh, Bohan around uh, how busy he is. And uh, he said he was very busy. I want to know if you are busy and what you are seeing in terms of the interest that's coming onto your table. Well, we're busy enough, but obviously there's always room to be more busy, as I've mentioned. But we're looking at projects, for instance, in Ethiopia, in Ghana, in Mozambique, and the various projects. When I mention these projects, these are huge projects, which most of the people in the market will be aware of. For sure. Telecoms, rail infrastructure, and gas, gas related power plants. So there are a number of projects which are in our pipeline. But obviously, we also want to support the smaller role players. Guys that's why well, the yeah. short-term trade focus. Yeah. I think that's where the shift now is going to be.
I'm going to come knocking Thanks. on your door as well, like I promised Bohan. I want the, uh, you, you, the, the two of you guys, Rian and uh, Bohan, to give you your thoughts as well on uh, this de-risking issue uh, very quickly, if you can, because we need to talk about the source of the money uh, that we require and which money is best suited uh, for infrastructure. And I know that's a contentious one, but we need to tackle it. Okay, so let me go to you, Rian, and then I'll come to you, Bohani. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I agree with my fellow panelists in terms of the de-risking. I, I just want to mention one aspect which is concerning yeah. is, is, of course, the, the, the sovereign debt issue. And given where we're going, that that risk could become higher uh, in a sense. So um, um, we, we will face that in, in the near future. And um, as many of the infrastructure uh, projects is based on sovereign guarantees, it poses a risk, and 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 we one need to think of of areas how to address it. If I can just talk about busyness, and I, I want to talk about larger industrial projects, which is a bit more our focus, not not necessarily infrastructure. We see a lot of activity and interest, uh, for instance, in the the mining and the the, the battery mineral space. Um, uh, in the continent in terms of, um, you know, moving into the EV market globally. So there, there are really interesting initiatives there. And of course, there's huge benefit from the current commodity boom um, that we are experiencing where we see um, interest in, in some of our, our standard uh, 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 commodities that we export and therefore value adding opportunities in, in terms of those. Um, so, so, um, uh, but just just to mention that as an opportunity that that we really keen or we we see the yeah. other area is of course in private sector provision of infrastructure you'll find that large companies actually invest in cold chain facilities themselves yeah. or funds being established to do so for instance in east africa etc and and uh, those initiatives should not be uh, disregarded although although smaller but but it does make an impact Thank absolutely you. absolutely uh, thanks for that i wanted to say to you i was reading earlier this morning when i was coming in that uh, apparently there's new technology that's been found that's able to bet to make our batteries that last longer but not using lithium so you might want to warn your customers technology uh, is great but i think it can leave you in the ledge um mohani let me come to you as well very quickly if you can your thoughts on de-risking I think uh, the, the the normal standard, um, you know, solutions like poly political risk insurance, syndicating the risk across multiple players, um, as well. I mean, selling down the risk and all of that, um, but also getting in technical expertise. Because I think part of the challenge with respect to projects, it's not around um, the financing only. It's also around project expertise and the ability to be able to complete those large scale projects on their grid timelines. And then of course, in addition to that, um, the standard normal financial products uh, that manage a wide range of risks from performance to credit risks and so forth. But I, I wanted to make this point to say, I think Beyond these normal standard products, I think there's a challenge that we do have as, um, you know, uh, financial institutions, both DFI and commercial banks, to say it is my view that if you look at the development of um, various regions, so whether it is Southeast Asia or whether it is, uh, uh, you know, NAFTA or whether it is uh, the EU and so forth, at the center of that, of, of the development, of the economic development of those regions, it's very strong home-based local financials or regional financials who understand the risk much, much better than, than partners outside. And I think the challenge we sit with as, as these institutions is we must be leading in quantifying and understanding the risks. My view is that oftentimes there's a whole lot of pers perspectives and perceptions around Africa risk that are not necessarily based on fact, if I may put it that way, but based on conjecture that comes from, you know, Africa is, uh, you know, all of these uh, historical issues. In actual fact, if you do the work and look through the continent, right, you can realize that although Mandisu talks about, um, uh, you know, some of the uh, areas where we've had problems, the number of active wars today 
it's probably at its lowest in 20 years. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, the, the number of other factors in terms of the economic state of the various countries, whether it's debt to GDP and all of those kinds of things, whilst we have problems here and there, a number of our economies are actually in a better shape COVID, of course, um, did come in and prevented specific challenges. And by the way, in my view, whilst COVID presented challenges, it also presented opportunities. Because one of the issues, and that's why we're having these discussions, amongst other things, is the fact that we had problems with access to financing, access to PPEs, access to vaccines, which, on the other hand, means that we must accelerate, um, you know, the, the investments in the kind of infrastructure that will enable these, these, these um, you know, vaccines or PPEs and many other uh, goods and services to be available within the continent. So, in other words, the creation of regional value chains has become even much more critical for the African continent. And it is very critical that we lead as financial institutions in Africa on the understanding, the quantification, and the management of risk in our various countries. Yeah. Thank one you. of the infrastructure pieces we need to address is the one that's just uh, hit uh, Tsepidi, and that's, of course, uh, 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 telecommunications, because we have to build reliable, functioning uh, 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 telecommunication systems across uh, uh, the African continent. And I wanted to say you guys have just given me an idea about a program. We need to talk about the progress that's being made in uh, getting companies to trade across borders and talk about the sectors that they are doing it. Uh, Tsepidi, you wanted to add two points. If you've forgotten your two points, however, I want us to move on and talk about the issue of uh, the money that we should be plowing into infrastructure. The story has always been we need to get pension fund, funny, sorry, pension fund money into uh, infrastructure. It's long term, it's, patient, it's the kind of patient capital that's required for the infrastructure, but somehow we're unable to do it. In South Africa, a study has been made. I want to know if you think that's a, a solution, but we'll also widen it to the rest of the continent and speak to perhaps issues that could be addressed. Um, thanks, Godfrey. Yes, I think, you know, my little issue is actually, I don't think it's more telecommunications, it's around maintenance, right? So right. The power outage, we always focus on building new infrastructure. I think the other focus that we need to drive is around the maintenance. Yes, and that's what just hit you. Was that a was that a power cut? Yes. It oh was. man. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you know telecoms is one thing, but I think power um, and stable power is, is is critical to industrialization. I caught Rian at the end talking about industrialization. Um, around patient capital, I think everybody is in agreement that infrastructure requires long-term patient capital. South Africa has made a great step. Right, so I think Reg 28 is critical in being able to unlock um, capital. I think more importantly for me, it's also around unlocking transparency and accountability for both pension funds and trustees. It incorporates things around, you know, ESG, so environment, social, and governance issues, which we don't talk enough about. Right, I think for us to be able to really drive sustainable infrastructure, we need to look at um, ESG and how it plays a role with all of the infrastructure assets we, we bring on board. So South Africa has started. It would be great to see more of this being rolled out across our continents. Traditionally, we have seen pension funds invest in T-bills, invest in government debt, invest in real estate. We really need to broaden um, the, the sectors within which they invest and really ensuring that they're matching their, their liabilities with these long-dated assets. I think it goes without saying that you know, there's a symbiotic and there's alignment, symbiotic relationship and alignment between um, pension fund money and this infrastructure asset class. Yeah, and the money that has come to you in support of our infrastructure development, what has been the main source of that money? It's been a combination, I think, interestingly enough, it's been a combination of both commercial funding, DFI funding, and pension fund capital. I think more and more you're seeing pension funds looking at alternative asset classes. So private equity is something that's come into play, and lots of pension funds are looking at it and have seen it as a credible um, asset class to invest in. 
So we're seeing it's been a cautious approach, but we really are seeing momentum in tapping into um, pe pension money. Again, this is open uh, to all of you guys. So if anyone wants to make a point uh, on it, please feel free to come in. You can interject and uh, talk about it. Um, I Good. asked, yeah, we got someone who wants to come in and uh, contribute. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. I just want to emphasize that point. I think, you know, the, the requirement to decarbonize uh, our, our different sectors is very relevant for, for the continent. Um, and I think it also, um, and, 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 and the whole ESG argument is becoming uh, very critical. So, so the, the issues that also come with new potential sources of funding because the whole world uh, is looking differently at these aspects now. And, and I think we're going into COP26. And, and I think we need to, um, as a, a continent, really try and attract all different type of funding um, to, to enable us to, for instance, I'm, I'm thinking, for instance, on the hydrogen economy and the potential that it could offer um, for, for the decarbonization and also some of our energy problems. There are specific countries, um, I know, for instance, Japan and Germany, etc., that is very keen to engage with the continent and not only facilitate the transformation, but also to fund some of those projects. And, and I think uh, we, we therefore need to think a bit differently and see how we can, uh, through the just transitions that is happening, moving away from coal, how we can leverage um, those funds. Uh, but it's very important that these projects need to be uh, uh, very good in terms of its ESG uh, requirements and, 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 and they could be new sources of funding. Thanks. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyone wants still to talk about source of funding and whether uh, pension fund money is the solution? And or whether we should also be looking at our foreign exchange reserves. Many people over time making the point that we are parking this money in jurisdictions where they are earning 0%, 1%, sometimes negative returns, paying people to keep our money when we should be bringing it home. Anyone wants to pick up on that one? Andisi, you want to come in? Bohani, you want to come in? Yes, I just want to come in that institutional investors have been quite active in the infrastructure space. Whether you talk companies like we work with PIC, Old Mutual, and many others. But you're right, obviously, there's a need to escalate the level of investment. So that's one source of funding that needs to be leveraged probably a lot more. Mm -hmm. But what uh, Rian mentioned, as I've said earlier on, with this focus on climate finance, or renewable energy projects, and the transition, you know, the just transition people are talking about. Yeah. There's other pools of finance outside of the continent that needs to be leveraged. So there's SA finance, but there's also opportunities for grant finance and concessional lending opportunities. So we would need to look for blended solution because that may assist addressing that earlier question you raised about the bankability of projects. Some of the projects, for them to be bankable, they will need a lot more blended finance, which includes grant funding, concessional finance, and export credit finance as well, as, as part of that mix, including the institutional investors. So the, we, we must broaden the pool sources of funding in, in that way. I think the issue of local currency finance and deeply those markets was highlighted. Yes. I think in the long term, that's a space that needs to be explored further. Obviously, the role to be played by African Development Bank in, is a catalyst towards those, those initiatives. I think that's key. So we do need to find solutions that uh, how can we, uh, you know, increase the limits or the tenors for, lo for, for local finance. Yeah. That's also a key element. 100%. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, um, Rian and uh, <clears throat> Mandy, see, I'm uh, working for the devil here a little bit. Africans like myself will be asking, why are we talking about decarbonizing uh, our, our power sources when we have no electricity? Hello, 600 million Africans are in the dark already. Give us some power, please, before you talk about clean power. Anyway, let's park that different argument. Another day we'll talk about it. Mohan, you wanted to come in? Yeah, maybe, maybe just to come in here. And I think Mandy's touched on a, a bit on the point I wanted to touch on, which is, I think what 
becomes more important is the collaboration going forward with various development financial institutions. So between um, you know, private financial institutions or commercial banks and development financial institutions in the form of ECAs and many others become quite key. And I think uh, he did touch, for example, on uh, you know, the, the increased focus on ECIC into short term. And I think um, we, we've recently been in, in, in conversations with uh, the ECIC to, you know, to do one particular transaction. I think what I see as critical is making sure, because there's multiple DFIs. And just if I look at the ones, who, you know, we have agreements with, and just simplifying and making sure that various players in the market can understand the requirements to be able to tap into those financials or to those into those facilities. Yeah. It's a bigger challenge than, in, in my view, in my experience, because we, we see it with a number of these. And when just when you look at the utilizations of those, uh, you kind of realize that maybe there is not uh, enough publicity, there's not enough understanding. Um, you know, some of them are sector focused, some of them are, you know, whether it's in agriculture or whether it's, it's green energy and so forth. But I don't think there's enough publicity and enough understanding of how we can utilize those. And I think uh, it will be critical to tap into those, both in terms of direct financing as well as guarantees. Thank you. Uh, we have about uh, six minutes of the show left, so I want you to think about wrapping up uh, your closing uh, thoughts in respect to what we ought to do. So in the lead up to that, I've got a question around what we need to do in order to be able for us to ramp up the work that's required. I asked in the notes that I sent to all of you whether the, the last time that you had heard about PIDA, the Presidential Infrastructure Commission Coordination, I can't remember the full name, and I'm asking the question, and I'm asking whether we need a platform that we, enables us, all of us, from an African perspective, to be able to see where these projects are or whether we should be doing that regionally. Because this national focus, in many cases, someone was making the point the other day that with those national focuses, we're losing at the objective of the creation of the African continental free trade area. So let me come through all of you. Sabidi, I'm starting with you. Very quickly, your thoughts on that. And you can then also wrap up your final thoughts. Um, so, Godfrey, PETA is close to our hearts as Africa 50. We are actually born from P PETA in that through PETA, you know, African Development Bank realized that because there was this significant infrastructure gap, we needed to look at things differently. We need to look at um, seeing how we drive um, project development and specifically set up within Africa 50 a project development arm. So Peter may not be known by lots of people, um, but we are um, the genesis, we are the genesis of, of Peter. Regional versus um, national infrastructure projects, I think we need both. You cannot, um, it, 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 to me it's not a binary approach. You need to be able to put in road infrastructure to get goods from the village to certain markets. We need to be able to transport manufactured goods and services between one country to another. So with regards to, so I think it's really important that one, we take both the national and regional approach to how we look at infrastructure. Yep. Technology, I think we haven't spoken enough about technology on this platform. And how is, it, how is it that we utilize technology to be able to, one, register the various projects that are being done, to be able to bring together funders, potential project sponsors, to be able to drive and implement these projects. So how is it that we use the latest technology, blockchain, et cetera, to really be able to position and showcase the various projects that are happening on the continent. So how do we digitize it's more? And I think we've realized all of us are sitting either in our homes or in our offices, we're having a conversation. So how is it that we utilize technology to bring players together, both locally and globally, to drive implementation of, um, of infrastructure on the continent as a whole? Great, so do we need a national and global platform, we definitely do. We definitely do. Thanks. Rian? Yeah, I'm in agreement. Uh, a platform is good. 
um, but it's it's quite interesting. Whenever you have a good project, the 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 different funders run to it. Um, so so I also need to re-emphasize the fact that these projects need to be de-risked from from a, a political level uh, and the different uh, to to a commercial level and the importance of strategic equity partners that give comfort to to project um, people or funders to actually get involved i think what will be very important is is that uh, it, we will be delayed if we don't roll out our vaccination campaigns uh, on the continent because i have seen projects that came to a halt because of travel restrictions. And I think it becomes uh, important that, that this is actually addressed uh, uh, as a complementary uh, issue to, 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 to the problem statement. Thank you. Absolutely. Wohan? Thank you. Um, I'm thinking, Godfrey, of um, how do we leave this? I think for me, it is important that we reflect on the fact that whilst we are seeing multiple challenges and some of them actually um, highlighted more by COVID, it's also important to realize that um, we brought together as a continent uh, 54 countries um, that translate into over $3 trillion, over 1 billion people into a single market. And we've probably done so in the fastest possible time compared to when the WTO was put in place in 1994. And whilst you could look at the numbers and say that 70, only 17 or 18 percent of, 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 of trade in Africa is in Africa, and maybe only 1% of uh, you know, steel manufacturing is, is from Africa, 3% of global trade is, is, um, is only into Africa, 3% of GDP, global GDP is only uh, from Africa. All of these things at the same time provide an opportunity for us to be able to come up with workable solutions that continue to take us forward. And in my view, the very fact that uh, you know, nine months later, uh, you've got over almost 40 countries that have signed up to the free trade agreement. Uh, you've got an agreement on uh, rules of origin, on a lot of uh, goods and services, goods in particular. You've got, um, you know, uh, those countries having ratified, also submitted, uh, sorry, articles of ratification, and in a position to commence trading is indication of both the will of the, uh, you know, governing countries or the governing the political um, sector as well as the you know the the private sector will because i think the issue about the continental free trade agreement it's not just an initiative that is there because it makes sense for us to get together it makes a lot of sense because there's economic opportunities Agreed. and those economic opportunities of course require financing 100%. and we as financiers need to continuously think about what is the best way to put financing on the table and i think um, you know conversations like this are quite critical to making sure that we come to the party we will come to the party mandisi i guess infrastructure is important but what is also necessary to enable this better trade among the African countries is further collaboration on border management and so that we could have one-stop border post. So it talks about more collaboration, but also harmonization of standards and procedures so that there's efficiency in the movements of goods. So if we want to have a continental trade agreement, those are essential elements if you compare what the EU has been able to achieve. Thank you. Very much indeed. Uh, the hashtag to follow is uh, at ATSA2021 if you would like to continue with the conversation. Thank you very much to my guests. Uh, let me just remind you again, Mantis and Kultu, Chief Operating Officer, Export Credit Insurance Corporation South Africa, at Sepidi uh, Moremong, Chief Operating Officer, Africa 50, Mohani Tlungwani, Managing Principal and Head of Sales at uh, APSA Group, and uh, Rian Kosia, Head Industry Planning and Project Development Unit at the Industrial Development Corporation. A very good morning and afternoon to all of you. Thank you for coming through. We're now going to say goodbye now to our viewers on CNBC Africa. But the discussions continue on Hopping Webinar Platform, where my colleague Nozipo Shabalala will lead the discussions. Nozipo, I've enjoyed myself. <laughs>